Hello and a very warm welcome to our daily service. This week we're looking at the second tablet of the Ten Commandments. God's commandments aren't arbitrary. They flow from his character. We're going to begin by saying together the words at the beginning of Psalm 111, which speak of God's amazing character and what he's done. Together we say, Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Gracious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. Loving Father, we praise you for your wonderful, faithful character. And as we marvel at your faithfulness, stir our hearts that we might be faithful too in all our commitments to one another and especially to you for the glory of your name. Amen. Psalm 111 verse 5, he remembers his covenant forever. God is absolutely faithful. And that means if we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are secure in his love. And that love does not depend on our performance. We let him down again and again. It depends on his promises. And as the faithful one, he always keeps his promises. And the God who is faithful calls on us to be faithful too. And so the seventh commandment. God says, you shall not commit adultery. It's put negatively, what we're not to do. But all the Bible's negatives in this area of our sexual lives flow from his great positives. God's wonderful design for sex and marriage, described at the very beginning of the Bible. I'm going to read now from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. All the Bible's negatives about sex flow from the great positives. They can be summed up in three statements. First, God is for sex. He's not a prude. He made us physical beings, sexual beings. And after the creation of Eve, Adam looks at her and he says, wow, we have the first love poem in the Bible here in Genesis chapter 2. God is for sex. And next, sex is for marriage. Having created a man and a woman, he institutes marriage as the context in which they're to come together in sexual union. The covenant commitment. And sex is is designed to be profoundly relational. It's the body language of lifelong commitment. It seals and expresses the commitment of their lives. And it's the context, of course, in God's design in which children are to be conceived and born and raised. God is for sex. Sex is for marriage. And marriage is for life. Genesis 2.24 is really the Bible's definition of marriage. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And Jesus quotes that verse in his teaching and then he says, That which God has joined together, let no one put asunder. The Bible does make provision for divorce, but it was never God's design. Here are the great positives of the Bible. Sex is for marriage, the marriage of a man and a woman for life. And the Bible's negative flows out of that. You shall not commit adultery. We shouldn't have sex before marriage or outside of marriage. And the Lord Jesus in his teaching makes it very clear how radical this teaching is designed to be. Here are some words from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, those words certainly make it clear that there's no room for, for judgmentalism or self-righteousness in this area. We've all sinned. We've all sinned sexually, whether in our hearts, or in what we've looked at online, or in a relationship, whether emotionally or physically. And we need to turn away from sin. But obedience to this command involves not just turning away, but turning towards and above all, turning towards the Lord Jesus. And the Bible teaches that the ultimate marriage is the marriage of Christ and his church. He's the heavenly bridegroom who came to seek a bride, make it possible for us to come to him through his death on the cross. And as we look to him, we find glorious forgiveness, whatever our sin. And by the Holy Spirit, a deep intimacy, a union with him. And that relationship with Christ will give us the strength, if we could look, keep looking to him, to remain faithful in our marriages, to remain faithful to him and pure in our singleness. As we wait for the time when he returns, when at last our union with him will be consummated, and there'll be the wonderful celebration of that wedding feast of the Lamb, as the Bible describes it. Until then, we keep looking to him. And we keep praying to him, as we do now, beginning with a prayer of confession. Together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. In his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul lists various sins, including sexual sins. And then he says these great words. That is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Loving Father, we praise you for full and free forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. And that because of his death for us, those who trust in him are washed, completely clean in your sight. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, and by the Spirit, please help us from now on to live pure lives for your glory. Amen. And now two prayers for all of us, married and single. Loving Father, we know that you instituted marriage, and that your Son blessed by his presence the wedding at Cana in Galilee. But we also learn from his example and teaching that marriage is not your will for everyone. Whatever our state, whether married, single, widowed or divorced, by your Holy Spirit, give to us a deep knowledge of your love for us in Christ and strengthen us to remain always faithful to you. For only in relationship with you do we find true peace and fulfilment as we wait to be fully united to our heavenly bridegroom at his return. And we pray in his name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, who instituted marriage between a man and a woman as a reflection of the spiritual marriage between Christ and his church, give your grace, we pray, to husbands and wives, that they may keep the vow and covenant they have made, remaining faithful to one another and to you as they serve each other in love and bring much blessing to their families and the wider community. For your glory. Amen. The focus of our song is the greatest love of all, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for us, by which we can be joined to him.
I'm so pleased you've joined us for our daily service. And whatever your situation, whether you're happily married or marriage is difficult at the moment, whether you're contentedly single or it's really hard for you right now, may you be greatly encouraged by the wonderful truth that all of us in Christ are joined to him. And may we look forward to that wonderful day of being fully in his presence. And in the meantime, may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and forevermore. Amen.